Uh, welcome back from lunch, everyone. My, my name is Deborah Yost, and I'll be presenting today on a concrete pavement smooth, smoothness and Section 40 of the standard specifications. So there's been um, there's new concrete uh, specification NSSP language uh, for two sections. It's the uh, general where there's smoothness requirements, and also the uh, pavement smooth, smoothness section um, where the measuring profiles and the target smoothness tables. And um, the changes are the um, ALR, um, the old language, uh, the ALR needed to be 120 um, inch per mile. And now the, the new ALR um, with the NSSP language is 160 um, inch per mile. And that, um, except for grinding existing pavement. And there's no ALR requirements for that. And for uh, the MRI, the uh, old language, the requirement was um, 60 inch per mile, and that cover that was for all situations. And for the new language, you um, the MRI, you, you the designers will refer to a concrete smoothness selection table to uh, determine the appropriate MRI. So this is the um, section of the standard specification that's been changed with. ALR will be um, the new requirements 160 inch per mile, except when grinding existing pavement. And then also um, the MRI, you, the, uh, re you refer to the concrete smoothness selection table. Uh, now this is the concrete pavement smoothness selection table, and it's broken down into pavement type, project type, and smoothness, and the specific smoothness table. And the, the, um, the pavement types are CR, CP, JPCP, and the project types are either um, new alignment or reconstruction, widening or lane replacement, and the third is grinding existing pavement. And then the four types of smoothness tables are target 60, target 67.5, target 75, and percent improvement. And um, this, the NSSP will be, um, this will be, it'll be issued as a um, NSSP in section 40, and the designer will fill out this table, and it show with the, where, where the smoothness requirements will apply, and it has a location for route, lane, direction, station limits, and then which payment, or sorry, which pay adjustment table applies, and there's four to choose from for uh, concrete. And this is the uh, tar first of four um, smoothness tables. This is the target 60. This will apply for CRCP, new alignment or reconstruction. And the maximum incentive is 1,500 per tenth mile. And, and then this, in this area from 45 to 55 MRI, that's the, um, the prorated incentive zone. And then there's a, um, this range from 55 to 65 MRI is the full pay, so there's no incentives or disincentives. And then there's disincentives prorated through here, and the maximum dis disincentive is 2250. And then this is the next one, target 67.5, and this applies to CRCP, widening or lane replacement, and also JPCP, um, new alignment or reconstruction. And the MRI is a higher amount to, um, or sorry, yeah, the MRI, if, if it's less than 50, then you can, the contractor will get the full um, incentive of 1,500. And um, this is uh, the zero pay, or full pay, for, for this MRI range from 60 to 75. And then, the, again, the dis maximum disincentive is, is um, 2,250. And then that is, um, up to 90, it's a prorated disincentive up to 2250. And then at, at this point, it's mandatory corrections of grinding. And again, this is the third table. It's, this applies to, this is target 75 MRI. And this applies to JPCP widening or lane replacement. And this one is different than the other ones that there's no disincentive pay. Um, there's only incentive pay of 1500 and that's available if the if it's ground or if, it, if the MRI is less than 50, and then um, there's a dis, uh, prorated 
um, zone for incentives, and then this full range of 60 to 90 MRI is the, the will be full pay. And then beyond this, it's mandatory corrections, which is the 90 and uh, above, it's ma mandatory corrections. And this is um, a percent improvement smoothness table. This is for grinding existing concrete pavement. And for this, there's no incentives or disincentives. The, um, it just is, is, uh, the, what has to occur is a 40% improvement from the existing MRI to the final MRI. And then if the MRI is let, starts with less than um, 100, then the, it just has to be 60 or less to, receive, to uh, be accepted. So the goal with, with this is smoother pavements with the incentives and disincentives with um, excellent is where excellent paving will get incentives. Good is full pay with um, no incentives or disincentives. And then this is the zone um, where there's optional disincentives and the contractor can grind into full pay, but you, the contractor cannot grind into incentive pay. And then it, in the corrective action, then the, they, um, to be accepted, the contractor will need to grind in that, in that range. So this is the uh, overview of the construction process for new concrete pavement. And you know, you know you've seen this for the HMA. And so I won't go into as many details, but um, basically we start with the QC plan. And then for a new concrete pavement, you, you only have the PAVE profile and also the final profile, and those will be used um, for the payment. And those, so those will be witnessed and received, what the Caltrans will witness, witness and receive those IP runs and then verify them and then the um, calculate and agree on the payments and then and then those worksheets will be provided to um, Caltrans for further improvement. And then this is the, showing the black box or the payment adjustment spreadsheet. And so the um, information from the spreadsheets, the different formulas are in this payment adjustment spreadsheet. So you, the, the uh, pave, pavement, uh, pave, pave profile and also final profile, that data goes in and then the data out, that, that is a tool it's, um, for the resident engineer to verify certain information, like if the pro, proval profiles were brought in directly to the, the payment adjustment spreadsheet, were they aligned with intolerance, and, um, and also if, if a profile was run by Caltrans, was it within 10% of the contractor's profile? And this is showing the process for the grinding existing um, concrete pavement. And for grinding existing concrete pavement, the IP runs needed are the existing, and then the baseline is for information only. And that baseline is run after there's um, uh, repairs or slab replacements. And then the final, when all final grind grinding is done. And then the payments are based on the existing and final, but we're still requiring to receive the baseline profiles. And then for, there's no payment, there's not a payment adjustment sheet, but it's rather a worksheet and it's deter to determine the acceptance, but it'll look similar to a pay the payment adjustment sheets where the proval, pro the pro proval information we brought in and verified. And then this is the showing the, that worksheet the, the, or the black box where that data goes in and then the equations and, and checking is, is done. It, it, it's a tool to help the RE. And then that's, um, then you, you're able to, the RE is able to check those um, four items on the, on the, along the side to determine if the, if the uh, profiles, or if, or if the, um, yeah, if, the, if, if, if it can be accepted or not, the final runs. And uh, Pete went over this slide, but um, this is um, the RE will issue a change order for uh, the supplemental fund allotment. And then those, if there's pay adjustments, then those will be done on a timely basis with, uh, with, on a, with the monthly payments. And then, but for, of course, for grinding uh, existing concrete pavement, there are no pay, pay adjustments, just only acceptance or, re or rejection. And then for more information, uh, this is the sm pavement smoothness guidelines, and it's for the construction administration 
of hot mix, asphalt and concrete, um, pavement smoothness, and we're in the final stages of, of uh, finishing this document. We'll be posting it on the construction internet page. Smoothness with this model, the plan do you check at, and the planning is, we've been in the planning stage for a while with improving the NSSPs and the training documents. Right now we're in the do stage where these NSSPs will be incorporated into projects and then um, we're conducting the training. And then the check will be receiving data from projects in 2019 and then seeing how the, um, if, how the payment adjustments have worked out, if, the pro if there's smoother payments. And then the act will be taking that data and analyzing it, seeing how we can improve the specifications. So it's a summary of, of what I said with the plan do check at. And these are the district construction pavement smoothness experts. Um, these um, employees have been identified by uh, management for the districts in be taking a lead role in pavement smoothness. And um, some of the names with the stars, they were also identified by the pavement program as, as the um, coordinators for, for the, this uh, pavement smoothness effort. And so we have, in the room we have Tinu Mishru. He's, he'll be taking an important role for District 4 in um, both for construction and also the overall effort of uh, smoothness. And then you, you might recognize some of the other names. And then the, these are the district experts or there will be learning along, um, you know, taking this training and learning. And they'll be also sharing this information with their own districts in training classes, um, like such as the RE, um, the RE meetings this spring. And when you get a chance, um, check out the pavement program, program's new website. And then there's um, smoothness guidelines for asphalt and concrete for de the designers. There's IP operators, NS, the new NSSPs for Section 36, 39, and 40, links to profile training, and then also the um, list of the district implementation team coordinators, and uh, so Tino will be on that list. And then we'll also have our own construction internet site, and we'll list the, the um, coordinators that, for construction. We'll have those on our website. And then... Um, yeah, our, our website's under construction right now, but we'll be adding this training along with some with our, our guide that um, that'll be finalized in a week or two. So now um, Blair will present this slide on the change orders. Uh, yeah, Blair, I have a question. Okay. The, uh, you talked about all these different types of coffee table. What about precast? Is there going to be a smoothness requirement? Just if you do, you know, right now I don't know if it's changed, but the forty-year design is we use precast at all the crossings, approaches, and all that. So they end up being lane replacements because it could be a couple hundred feet or longer in length. So is there going to be a, or is there a requirement for smoothness on that? For, for precast? For precast. Um, smaller districts don't get involved in the seven and four and maybe sometimes three. So I'm just curious. Okay. You know that, um, do you do you know offhand about precast? Or? Were they typically using yeah. straight edge requirement on precast? Um, we haven't had anything really out there. I mean, we're out there grinding them. But okay. We do use kind of straight edge. You're right. We're not so using them. Uh, how long are they? Are they? I mean, oh, they could be long. We could have, we had miles of it. You know, we had placed up to, I don't know, a mile and a half on a lane. And the other thing was individual slots. It looks like they're not part of it, right? Individual slot replacements, whether it's precast or not. That's not part no. of this. Yeah. Okay. No. So, yeah, that's my question is that. I don't know. I mean, I think um, it's necessary to smooth it out, but I don't know. We can yeah. go back to the asphalt I and mean, the concrete group and talk to them a little bit more yeah. and get, yeah. get to respond to the Yeah, especially if it's a long length like that. Yeah. That, would, that would make sense. Yeah. We capture that as a pre as a over a thousand feet. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. I mean, seven has miles. I mean, I think the last job we did on 210 when I went down there was probably around 12 miles pre cast, so length. Lane is 12 miles or something like that. Some, some big value. Is it common to grind those? Or just yeah, we should grind those because you can't match cast. Oh, yeah, it's in the, the back table. Okay. Um, are there any more? Uh, so we'll, thanks for bringing that up. We'll, yeah. I'll bring it back to our, 
or some other others that will have some more input on that. But sure. um, is there any other questions as far as the concrete pavement smoothness goes? No Jobs that are out there right now would not have incentives uh, programmed into them. So there's been uh, a discussion um, within headquarters construction, and you know we've had some jobs that have gone to claim over smoothness issues. And uh, um, so what we're working on right now, we've got a uh, acting division chief, and he's got us working diligently on developing um, a CPD and sample change orders to allow uh, contractor requested change orders to allow uh, the, the deduction or the allowance of higher smoothness limits um, for going contract. So what we're looking at doing is, is basically prorating prorating the, uh, um, the disincentive in lieu of grinding uh, down to the 60 level or down to the 75 level um, and allowing a contractor to take a deduction in lieu of grinding or get the state, um, you know, uh, basically the deduction back. <coughs> um, so that's what, the, that's what this slide basically says is, you know, we've got those variable deductions. Um, from the 80 to the 60 limit based on, you know, whether they'd have to look at what the existing uh, condition is. But if it's over 165, um, then the deduction would apply. And if it's for 75, it's over the 135, it would apply. So, um, but it also just allows it to go all the way down to, to 75 if they, don't, if they don't meet it from anywhere from uh, 90 to 75. So, um, anyway, that's it. That's be coming out soon. We've got... Uh, We've got like three or four different cases. It depends on what, what your um, pavement condition is, but we've got some sample change orders. The draft CPD has been being routed through right now to FHWA to make sure that they're on board with it. And if we get approval, then we'll, we'll have a uh, pre-approved um, change orders. So that's about it. Any questions? That's our last slide. So the contractor's got to provide aligned profiles, which they probably won't have in many cases. If they don't, is, if they is don't there, have a line, is there a percent difference between it that we can? Is there going to be like a percent difference kind of thing between their alignments? Because when I was out there without this spec, we just marked it black cones and markings on the pavement, and we all knew where they were. We didn't play with them all that. We didn't have the green. But, uh, You're they, saying if they're to jive our existing to their existing? What, what, what is, I don't know. Yeah. Saying. I think what, you, what we're saying is right now, if you had a job that was a 75 spec, right? Yeah. The contractor pays an 80 yeah. and a bunch of 10 mile sections. Yeah. Sections that you have to grind down to 75. Right? We're saying, okay, it needs the 80, but we're going to take a distance set. Oh, right. X many dollars per point over 75 up to the but now, if you're overlaying, instead of making the price like you're used to, we'll give them. We'll give them. Uh, but if we're not going to give them an incentive, yeah. So what's what's going to happen in a lot of cases? I think I'm just guessing is there's going to be a lot of pavement where the contractor says, "Oh, it was way rougher than 135. He's not going to be able to prove it because he doesn't have profiles that align. Right? He doesn't have existing profiles that align with what he's trying to." So I mean, assuming he does, you know, it's they're all simple to just like. 200 feet or so. Well, the equation is going to mess up. And right now, using all of that. But if you can't get the existing profile to line up with your, you know, they're already going to have to work with the contractor to come up with some kind of reasons. How they're going to come up with that, but you can't. Yeah, you can't just go back to this. If you've got a, if you've got a single opportunity or, a, or say, a new, uh, not a single opportunity. If you've got a target 75 job and your, you know, and your existing pavement's under 135, um, then it just is a straight deduction. You know, if I got a 90, we'll buy the 90, but you would have to probably, you know, give the state back the maximum deduction, right? Or if it's if it's under 90, if, it, if they got an 80, we'd accept the 80, but you know, you're going to give us five fifteenths of the you know, of the, of, the, of the deduction amount. It'd be prorated. Uh, if it's over 135, there's another um, 
there's another change order that has a formula that calculates it a little differently. Um, but you know, if we can't get the existing profile and their profile to line up, well then maybe we just we don't you know we can't agree on the over 135. Then you know, at the worst case, you could go back to the to the 75 case. At least they, you know there would be an opportunity to take a take a deduction. All right, Pete's going to get into uh, the spreadsheet, I think, at this point. dot.ca.gov slash hq slash construct. Okay, so this is our, our construction web page that where the contractor can get their smoothest spreadsheet. This was active as of like two or three days ago. So here we have the, the payment adjustment spreadsheet. We also have a sample PVP file that's got the four profiles in there. So if you leave today and you want to pre play with the scene, you can download this spreadsheet. Download that PVP file and you know, walk yourself through this appendix. So on your own time, you can do that. I'll just kind of walk through it in general. So there's also a video here on, <clears throat> this, this is a raw video. I need to make it more professional, but it, it goes through what the steps a contractor's got to do to fill this sheet out. So walks it through step by step, which would take nothing but a lot of time to do right now. So we're going to skip through that. So Okay, so once, once you download this spreadsheet, right, you're going to have that. That's the name of the file. <clears throat> I'm not going to download it right. I'm not going to start it right now, but our versioning is going to start out as we started out I was 1.00 and then I found something I needed to change. I hit change it now we're on 1.01. .01. So always go to the website to download the latest spreadsheet. That'll have any new changes in it. And we're going to go 1.01, 1.02, 1. If the specs change, we we have different tables and everything's changed, right? We'll call it version 2. So we're we're in version 1. Subversion zero one or whatever. Okay, so um, okay, so this is the spreadsheet as it was named. So if I were a contractor, I would have downloaded that empty spreadsheet. I would have loaded up my existing profile, my baseline profile, my final profile, and my paved profile because I completed all the work, right, and I'm going to present this spreadsheet to the RE as a payment adjustment request. So when you get this request from the contract, you're going to get this spreadsheet. You're also going to get this PVP file. So you'll get these two files here. These, these top four files are the actual raw data files that are zipped up into that PVP file that I'm opening right now. So you double if you have you got to have Proval installed on your computer, first off, right? You want to make sure you got the latest version, 3.6. We had some old guidance out that said if you're developing grinding plans, use a ver older version, 3.5. Well, we don't need to do grinding plans anymore as Caltrans. So now we're saying use the latest version of Proval, 3.6. So when you open up Proval, you know this is what you get. Kind of sometimes it opens up to the last screen you had. So these are the four different profiles. So we're going to be, you know, I, I would have received this profile, project file, and this spreadsheet from the contractor. So. Can I ask a quick question? Yep. So the profile that you opened up right here is what these guys would be getting from the contractor. It's already pre-populated with, yep. with the data. Yep. The spreadsheet that's on the internet that you showed us it was the empty is a completely blank spreadsheet. Yep. Right. Yeah. Okay. Did everybody? Copy it, follow that. I mean, that, the one on the internet's got nothing in it. You got to populate it with your job data. So, okay. So the other part that's really important is, you know, this spreadsheet's got a lot of macros in it that have all these tables that are in your specs. Otherwise, we'd have these huge equations that have if 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 if. You can't go more than seven ifs. So we have these macros. So, you know, it's doing everything with custom functions. There's a lot of fancy things going on, but so. When you download, when you start this spreadsheet, you're going to get this warning here. It says, security warning, some active content has been disabled. Click for more details. So 
It's not if you don't click enable content, the spreadsheet's going to not work. You have to enable content. So this was, you know, you can trust this spreadsheet. <laughs> it doesn't get doesn't get in, <laughs> doesn't get in your bank account. No. Okay, so I enabled the content. The other part that I found out like last week was I was working with a representative from Cal App and we're like trying to work over the internet with each other looking at the same screens. I sent him a file that I attached to an email. He clicked on it, opened it up, and he said, Man, it's not working. Well, I'm getting errors all over the place. And I'm like going, oh no, right? I click on that same file in Outlook, and I'm like, I'm getting the same errors. It's, you know, it was working before that. I didn't know what was going on. Well, when you open it up in Microsoft Outlook, I think Outlook has some antivirus software. You can't open it up in Outlook or some email programs. You got to open it up outside of Outlook. So if you want it to work, so there's a warning on that front page: Do not open within email programs. So, you know, this is kind of the same way with HMA Pay that we had. You know, I had a lot of macros in there, and that's how we made our payment adjustments. So, you know, contractors are going to have to enable content if they want to get payment adjustments. So, I mean, there's plenty of antivirus programs. You can you can run this thing through something called Virus Total. It'll check it through 65 different antivirus programs to, you know, say it's safe. It's safe. So. Okay, so we, we, we click that button, right? So so now I'm at RE, and I got this payment adjustment request. And, oops. And what's a contractor? This is one lane, and he wants a $25,000 adjustment, 600. So I'm just going to pay it, right? No, we can't just pay it. we got to check it. These values are based on all the values that the contractor put into the spreadsheet. We're not just going to take him for his word. We're going to bring all the same data out of ProVal and make sure everything's... He didn't modify any values. So now these ProVal files, there's a lot of security on the ProVal files where they can't go in there and manipulate the ProVal project file or these raw PPF files. is what they tell me. It's not something you can easily do. And if you do, it's got ways where they can track them. They can't modify those files. So, right? Sure. <laughs> well, they can modify it, so you could still go back and find out what they did. That, is that how that works? Out. Okay. Yeah, we can. You, we, look, we ask for raw data, but you can. A user of ProVal can go in there and see the, the modifications they'll make is through the filtering process. So they yep. take out high frequency and low frequency. So it's definitely right. doable. Okay. Maybe there will be. A, would you say in the spec to give raw data? Yeah, so maybe eventually we'll make a video on that, on how to make sure they didn't modify it, right? And you'll help me because you know how to, you went to George Chang's training on that. Okay, so the way the spreadsheet works is it's just essentially we have a front cover sheet. You can see the, the worksheets across the bottom. We have the front cover sheet. It's called the pay adjust worksheet. We have four different tabs for the contractor to import values. These are the green tab worksheets. There's one for each profile that they have to import. And he's already done that. We can click on one of those. We'll see all the data. The yellow cells are where the contractor's inputting values. So he, he went in ProVal and basically just copied a table and pasted it in the top left corner, and it populated this table is what it did. So he did that for the baseline. He did it for the pave, and he did it for the final. Now, there's a couple of these files where I just went and modified a couple of numbers just for demonstration purposes so that we can see if he changed anything. So what we're going to do now is... I'm just going to show you how simple this is. You do this a couple times. It's it's really simple. So if I had to do this in three months and I didn't do it for three months, it might be not as simple. But I would just go to my spreadsheet or my appendix F and I'd figure out how to do it really quick. So I got to go to the Proval project file, right? I need to import the existing profile. So I'm going to import the existing profile data. The baseline profile data, the paved profile data, and the final profile data. I'm going to cut and paste them in here. And all these red cells are going to go away because right now that indicates it's not the same as what's on the contractor's worksheets. So 
We'll go to the verification existing profile. We'll go to the, okay, so now this is ProVal, right? When you open it up the screen, you might come up, um, come up with a different screen. So we're going to go click on this analysis button. This is the main button in all of ProVal. So this is where you can get into modules. We've got all these different modules. You know, profiler certification, they use that to certify the profiler. If you want to do a rolling straight edge, you can click on that. If you had the profile data, you could you know, model what a rolling straight edge would do through the whole project, rather than getting on your hands and knees and pushing a straight edge. If you want to do a grinding plan, you click on Smooth Assurance. So we're going to be in ride quality, so that's where we're going to be all day here in this demo. So you click on ride quality, and I know I'm there because I can see this car button here. It says analysis, ride quality. And this top left corner here, it says ride quality. I know I'm in the ride quality screen, so. Now I want to run the MRI report. So you have to think through this logically. You're just going through these drop downs, so analysis type. So if I click that, I got three choices overall. If I, if I select that, it's going to give me the overall MRI for each lane. I don't want that. If I click continuous, it's going to give me a, a moving average roughness report, which we might use for ALR. We'll use that later. I don't need, want that right now. Fixed interval, that's the third choice. That's the, that's the one we want, right? That's the MRI values. We're picking out 10th mile segments. We're going to click that. Once I click that, now i got more choices. Okay, now it's the ride quality index. So you click that next drop down, and you have all these choices. These are for all the other states. We use IRI and MRI. If I click IRI, that's what's clicked right now, I can see that I can get a roughness report on each wheel path. I want the mean roughness index, which is the average of both wheel paths. So I click MRI, select MRI. So this is the ride quality fixed interval MRI report. Remember that, right? Easy. So the threshold, you know, it doesn't, all I'm doing is pulling MRI data out there. I don't really care about a threshold, but I'll just put in 135 because that's one of the numbers that we seem to care about. Okay, so now <clears throat> I haven't selected a profile yet, so you can go up here, you can select it, each one of these individually, or you can click on this button up here and it selects them all. If you wanted to erase them all, you click the erase button next to it, we select them all. Okay, so now we've selected all these profiles and we want an MRI report. You know, give us the MRI values for every tenth mile on all four of these profiles. And once I click analyze, that's what's going to do. But what I want to make sure I do first is make sure this 250 millimeter filter button is clicked. These boxes are checked here. Some, sometimes it seems like they don't check themselves. There's been a couple times where I think I had to check those. But. So what that does is models the 10 inch tire contact of the quarter car model. That's in our specs. We have to implement the 250 millimeter filter. That just smooths out the road over 10 inches. Look analyze. So now it's analyzing that and it's running that quarter car model down all wheel paths. There's eight wheel paths. And now it's saying, okay, what's the average fixed increment roughness? So we see one report down here, but I see four profiles up here. Why is that? Okay, there's a, it, what we see down here is based on what we select in this drop down. So right now we're looking at the existing. I could select the final, I'd see a different plot. So I'm going to start with the existing. So that's the fixed increment report, right? I can look at it in tabular form. That's the data that we're going to import. I'll show you how to do that. And then we can also see it in a map view. If I'm connected to the internet, you'll be able to see where this project's at. If you're not connected to the internet, this is not going to, this map function doesn't work. So we can zoom out. We can see it's, you know, this is in Merced County on Route 59. We can see all the fixed increments. This blue fixed increment is the first fixed interval. It didn't go over that 135 value that we typed in there. And the second one did, so that's why it's red. It's, it's just going to go red if it's over whatever threshold we picked up here. So there's a leave out. They must have put a leave out in there for some reason. You know. There's, there's another leave out. There's more leave outs further down the road. So we're, at this point, we're just going to accept the fact that all the leave outs are correct. You'd be checking that. Now we're going to go to the table. So, so here's what you do. You're going to, any, any table in ProVal, you can copy to a spreadsheet by right-clicking in the header row. 
And you get a choice copy table of the clipboard or copy table without column names. We want the column names. So now it's on my clipboard. I'm gonna that's the existing profile. You know, if I wasn't sure I'd make I'd double check to make sure that's the one I selected there. Yep, that's the one I selected. I'm just going to paste it into the verification for the existing profile. Okay, so we see red here. Well, this is a this is a value that I changed. Our report says it was 78, so ours is 101 less than what the contractor has, and I bumped this MRI value up for a demonstration I'm doing later, but. So we can see the contractor changed one value. We'd, we'd return this thing back to him and say, hey, you're not supposed to change anything. Right? Your payment adjustment request is rejected. So here's the summary that we showed you on that slide. You know, all four row, all, the first three rows match, the first one, the fourth row doesn't. It, you know, it counts how many don't match. So okay, we're going to go get the baseline profile now. We already ran the MRI report, so we just need to go to the baseline, right copy, right, right click, copy table to clipboard. Go back and get the, the PAVE file. Right click, copy table to clipboard. We're going to get the final file. Something crazy. Oh, that's right. Okay. There you go. See? It's the first time I did that. That just shows it works, right? <laughs> I did that on purpose. I wish. Okay, now I'm not mixed up. Copy table to clipboard. Go to the verification final. Here's a button where I, this each page, I can delete everything that's on that sheet right now, or just paste over it. Okay, so so on the verification file, there's one mismatch. The baseline, I think I changed one. There, I also changed one there. There's one mismatch for the demonstration. The pave, I didn't change anything. Everything matches. The final. It's way off to the right here because we got more stuff that comes in here. Everything matches. Okay, so now for this for demonstration purposes, we're just going to assume everything matched. Okay, because I had to change some numbers in here to show you how fixed increment or full width segment corrections and partial width segment corrections work. So, okay, now the next thing we want to do is, okay, what's the next thing? We would go to our pavement. Those PPF files that we got every single day, I'm going to go to the last worksheet here. Okay, I want to, I want to just do a check to make sure that the files that he get, that he provided me in this PVP file are the same PPF files that we received every single day. And that I would have been, when I got those PPF files every day, my RE, or my inspectors picked them up, I'd be filing them where I could go get to them later. You know, you should you should do this check. So now we want to go to a ProVal, and we're just going to do this. We're going to bring in the overall values for all four of these profiles and paste it in here. We're going to paste it without the column data. So the next thing, you know, we, just go, we click overall, MRI. That's the only choices we have. There's no more drop downs because there's no reason to have them. We're going to select them all, analyze. This just gives you the overall values. So now I want that table in without the headers, copy table without column names. Paste it in here. Okay, so now I, now I'd go to, you know, if I was organized as an RE, I'd have all these PPF files where I could go click on the PPF file and get the overall MRI value, and I'd paste them in each one of these rows, you know, individually. They're not going to be in a separate PVP file. But I'm going to take a shortcut here. I'm just going to say it's the same. You know, I could change some of these numbers. These, some of these MRI values, when I looked at every PPF file, it might be a little bit different because they might have jogged a, a leave out a little bit. But you should see these numbers are approximately the same or exactly the same. 
So that's kind of the check to make sure that the data you received out in the field that you witnessed is the same as what they're submitting to you on the PVP file. You know, we can also look on the map and make sure, yeah, it is that highway. It's got the GPS coordinates in it. We know it's on that highway. We can click on the map. We saw that. Okay, so now I would go find my one and only profile. I probably asked my District 3 office to run to verify, and I would have chosen the final profile. I'm just going to, I don't have that profile, so now we're just making, taking a quick step here. We're saying, okay, this is the, I went and got my verification profile, and my district inertia profiler operator would use the same naming convention to help me out, except he would have, he'd stick VER on the front of the final name. That way I know when I'm looking at the file, it came from our verification profiles. Let's say we had a 53, or say we got a 53 on that. You know, this is the final, so I'm just going to type in 53 here. I didn't make it go up automatically because I didn't know that. I wasn't sure that people paste them in on the right rows. So now we did this verification step. The contractor had a 50.5. We got a 53. We're 5% difference. It's less than 10%, so we're verified. So we're doing that one of those verification files per 10 contractor profiles, hopefully more, but a minimum of one. So we are taking the contractor's data. We're using his, his information for payment, but we can only do that when we verify that, you know, that data is correct. We're not having to, the FHWA, we've had discussions, they're not telling us we've got to go verify every single profile. So is there any questions so far? Okay, so, so the next step I want to do is go back to this payment adjustment worksheet. Right, and they, you know, I'm going to look at this and I'm going to say, okay, my, my plans, I'm looking at my plans. Yeah, you got 1500s. You put the right number in there. The total ops, yeah, it was a, it was a grind and paid back the same shift, or it might have just been a straight overlay. That's one op. You didn't put two in. They're not going to, they're going to want to put a lower number in. Oh yeah, there's there's more op options there. The the layer thicknesses are in five hundredths. You know, that's what designers are supposed to design in. If first if you decide if you ran a change order for an increase the thickness from fifteen hundredths to seventeen hundredths for some crazy reason, I did that a few times as an RE because I had extra quantity. Yeah. Okay. Um, each one of these yellow cells is an input cell, so there's wherever you see a red triangle in, these, in the top right corner, you can just hover over it. It's going to give you guidance on what you should be entering there, you know, if you can't figure it out. Well, there's a lot of information here. Like we're having the contractor enter the, the contract item price. It doesn't come into the adjustment calculations anywhere, but we're collecting a bunch of data, and we just want to know, you know, what was the item price for all these different segments. So we're going to collect all these projects from all over the state, put them in one big database, we'll be able to sort based on common types. Okay, the next, so we know the layer thickness is a function of the, we have to know that to know what table, we have to know the opportunities for improvement. And we also have to know what is it, is it, you know, we go to our tables, our specs, there's standard tables for HMA and then there's standard tables for OGFC. And then there's standard, then there's another set of tables for OGFC on new, so. When I pick this drop down, I have a choice of four different types. I have type A over existing uncorrected, over uncorrected existing surface, type A over corrected existing surface, type A over coplane same shift, type A over coplane previous shift. This doesn't really affect the table that we're using, other than we're just collecting this information for, you know, so we can study this information later, so we can grab all the jobs that were. Type A over uncorrected existing that were 1500s. We could see how well the contractor did. You know, if we get down to the, if we go down to the bonded to open graded friction course, there is a special table for o OGFC on new. So this one doesn't. We have we have two other tables for OGFC on a mill service and over OGFC on existing. They're similar to the tables that we have for all the other types of HMA. Incentives and disincentives, but they're different. 
So if you pick one of those, you know, that'll pull in the correct table. If you pick OGFC on new, now when we talk about OGFC on new, we're talking about HMA that we placed on that project, and we already made a payment adjustment for that new HMA that we're placing open graded over. It already had to meet spec, right? So this open graded friction course on new HMA, this is not part of that layer thickness. This is its own layer thickness. Our specs basically say just don't make it rougher. If you do make it rougher, we're gonna we're gonna charge you. So they had a 70 out there and they put open graded down to give us a something rougher. Then there's a disincentive. If they give it to us as smooth or smoother, there's no disincentive. So, so we click if you click open GFC on new, everything goes blue down here and it, it changes a whole bunch of stuff. So that that'll be rare where you're doing that. So we're just going to say this is type A over uncorrected existing. Okay, so we know that, you know, we, we verified the contractor, all the data came out of ProVal. We trust his data now, right? Now we have to basically go into it and say, okay, what else do I need to check? Can anybody think of anything? Like the localized roughness, ALRs, we're just going by, the con we're giving them incentives based on MRI, right? Irregardless of what ALR values are. The contractor has to give us a surface that doesn't have any localized roughness that exceeds the threshold. So here he's saying that each one of these segments, if you read this header here, it basically says contractor certified number of ALRs above threshold. User entered or if, if none, enter zero. So we're forcing him to enter a zero here. He's got to make the statement to us that there's no ALRs. If he, if, he, if he leaves that blank, that, that, that value gets a strike through. You can see what it is, but now this whole blank is non-compliant, right? So every one of these, he's got to basically tell us that he's resolved all that localized roughness. Is there any questions so far? No. Okay, now when you first get this spreadsheet, you know, if, it, if there's any red on it, first thing you'll do is, like, it's non-compliant. Give me something that meets spec. It's non-compliant. What are you going to do, contractor? So there can't be any red, or you're just going to re reject this their payment adjustment request because it's not per spec. So is there any questions? <laughs> We're forcing the contractor, you know, he's got to, he has a spec. He knows what's required. So. Okay, so we put, we'll put zero back in there, and that strike through goes away, and that red goes away. If I had any MRI values that were in that mandatory correction level, instead of seeing a dollar amount here, I would see must correct in red. And I, it, this, one, this cell up here would count how many of those there are. So both these have to be zero to get a dollar amount adjusted. Okay, now, we, now we'll, we'll go into the, to the MRI max and ALR max. Okay, so now with these new specifications, in the past all we had to do was check that MRI was 75 and the LR is 160. That's, you know, we, we still have kind of the similar case, you know, now it's up to 90 with deduction and it's still one, and it's 160. Unless we go into percent improvements and those numbers go up, well, they're going to go up for every different every segment. They might be something different if you're in percent improvement. So when they change, you know, the value is going to display in this column Q here. So I can see here that this the values. If we look at all the MRI values, the job went into percent improvement. So I have a MRI max is it's at 93.7 and my ALR max is at 160 when you do all the math. The ALR max threshold is based on that target times 2.1. There's a lot of equations all through these specs. And this calculates everything for you. Yeah. So for the ALRs, so as an RE then, how does an RE figure out if the ALR really was zero? Okay. All right. So th that's the next step here. Yeah. And all this stuff, if you guys are falling asleep right now, which I can see half of you are, this is so exciting. All the steps you need are in this Appendix F. 
right, later you can put through this. So, okay, so now <clears throat> we're going to say we're the RE, right? And we're saying, okay, you know, you guys are, you want this adjustment. Did you resolve all the ALRs? i got to verify all the ALRs are gone. So I'm going to go into my Proval file that you gave me, contractor, and I'm going to get the localized roughness report. So what is localized roughness? It's the continue it's the moving it's a continuous moving average roughness of a 25 foot 25 foot long sliding segment, right? So to get that, I mean ride quality. What do you think I should pick? Overall continuous or fixed interval? Continuous moving average. Right? Think you got to think that way. You're talking about ALR moving. You need to recognize what it is. And we're going to look at IRI because that, that spec applies per wheel path, the localized roughness. And I'm going to go look at his final profile. And he should have he should have gave me that final profile, three of the ALRs, right? And right now there's a threshold number in there of, of 90. I'm going to put 160 in there just so I have that red line on there and I can see where things went over. I know I have one segment where the, well, that one segment was 160. Everything was 160 on this project. Okay, I've selected the final profile. I'm going to analyze it. Now, it's going to give me the localized roughness of each wheel path. And I can see that 160 value right there. I can see there's locations in the wheel paths that didn't go over, that they didn't address the localized roughness. So by spec, I'd say, you know, spec says you're supposed to give me a surface that doesn't have any LRs over 160. What do you, this has values over 160. Like I can't make, I can't accept this. Fix it. So that's how you get to the localized roughness report. So if I were to look at each one of these, I could go to the table here, and I get another table. But it's you know I have two things choice. I have the left and the right ch chosen here. I got a choice of the two. So I'm, right now I'm looking at the left wheel path. In fact, I can look at a different table for the right wheel path. These are all the locations where the ALR started going over 160 and where it went back under, and then the peak value. So, you know, the contractor gave me this file. He should have addressed his ALR. This is the spec. So, so for the beginning, I'm just curious. For the beginning of the Proval run, does Proval give you the uh, coordinates of the first point, uh, the first semi-permanent reference point? That you um, I think in the viewer or the editor. It'll show that in there somewhere. Okay, here, here's the other here's the other thing that in this video I've made for the contractors to make sure that all these profiles line up with each other. Is that what you're getting at? How would you check that? Yeah. Okay, so in this video that fills shows how to you know kind of walks a contractor through the steps they need to do is <clears throat> okay. What I want is a I want a report that will show me where. ALR, or where some IRI values were calculated, MRI or IRI. What I like, what the, the one I think is best to look at is, you can look at the, you know, it's the ALR report is the 25-foot moving average of both wheel paths. If I want to look at all four profiles, I'm going to have eight lines, right? If I only, I'm trying to minimize the amount of lines, I'll, I'll pick MRI. That'll, that'll change it to four profiles, one line per profile, four lines. I can go ahead and select all the profiles. And this, these files are lined up. And if you were to take any project that, where people just didn't care about lining these profiles up, you, you're not going to see this. So I can basically, that's the localized roughness average of both wheel paths. We don't have a spec on that, but it's one, it's one plot per line. You look in the legend here, the yellow is existing, blue's baseline, green is pave, and pink is final. This is a six mile long job, so I see six miles on the screen here. I can click this magnifying glass and look at a tenth mile at a time or a half mile at a time. I'm looking at a half mile at a time. I can slide forward by clicking the bar here. Nope. Let me go back to the beginning here. The most important thing, again, is that all these profiles, they start at the same point, right? Because all these, all the MRI values, all the 
values coming out of here are going to be based on those common stations that go into a table. I'm looking at them. They, they seem to line up with each other. Down here, this leave out, yeah, it looks like everything lines up. If, if somebody forgot to put a leave out in or the leave outs were way different, you know, you, you, you'd be able to notice it on this report. Then the other part is over here on the contractor sheets, there's some columns here I put in here to help them figure out what it, if there's misalignment issues, what the issues are. So everything is based on the existing profile. So when we're looking at that data for the existing profile, we see the start distance, the stop distance of that segment, the length of that segment. Most of them are 528 until we get to one that's right before we leave out, and then it's a partial. The segment number. Okay, so remember this 483 number. So if I go to this next profile, their baseline, that 483 number came here. This is a different number. This is from the base. That's a slightly different partial segment length than this one. You know, I can see that, you know, it's a quarter foot difference in stationing, which is less than what our specific specification tolerance is. Is we, Our alignment tolerances are they have to be within, for the first mile, it's got to be within 20 feet. Seems like a lot when a tenth mile can be, you know, you only have a, when they're running the DMI, you only have a plus or minus a foot and 528 feet. Why can't it be 20 feet off in the first segment? Well, if you're, you know, if you're on a highway, it's one lane in both directions, I can put a reflector out there. And when I'm driving the inertia profiler down, I can set it up so that it's going to read the reflector. I just click a button, the reflector's coming up, and then it picks it up automatically, and it figures out what that station is. If I'm in the middle of the freeway, you know, it's four lanes over, I put the cone over there, I'm not going to be able to pick it up. So I'm, I'm going to have to use the other option in the profiler where I'm clicking it, right? You're doing 50 miles an hour, 60 miles an hour. If you can get within 20 feet, that's halfway between two reflectors. <laughs> that's pretty, pretty accurate. So I mean, you know, we recognize that there's going to be some tolerance issues. So, you know, that's if it, if it goes, if there are any misalignment issues, they'll see a lot of red on this page. So now we can look at. I know for a fact on this project that every one of these leave outs, everything looks good. They all line up with each other. There's a leave out there. You can see it lines up. They're all in line with each other visually. I can zoom at a tenth mile scale if I want. But when I get to the end, you know, there's a, I don't know, I just didn't slide all the way down to the end real fast. It's hard for you to see this, but the existing profile ends down here somewhere. 50 feet is from here to here. So once I get over two and a half miles, I can be up to 50 feet off. So a couple of these are not within 50 feet, the, the last station. So on our spreadsheet, our spreadsheet should tell us there's a misaligned, misalignment issue. You can see red here, it says misaligned. Down here, we can see, you know, one of these is 67 feet when it can't be over 50. So there's some issues there. They should have moved that leave, that marker up for the end. You know, if I looked at this, it was the last station. It's like, does it matter? You know, it's not that big of a deal. If I had a misalignment issue somewhere in the middle here, it's going to carry through the whole project. So it, it's going to make everything off. Hey, Pete. Uh does that kind of happen at the end of everything when you're doing a four-lane road and they're coming back the other way and going and starting from the upper end of the of the project? Okay, so so this. In other words, we're going northbound on I-5. And we're on those two. You can see the marker, but maybe when they flip around, come the other way, they're going down station, right? Okay, so with the inertial profiles, when I'm in the inertial profile vehicle, I have to tilt. I haven't run one of these. I just am told how people, they have to initialize what that beginning station is, right? Then they have to say, is it going to increase or decrease, right? So you going north or east, you'll put that beginning station in, and it's going to increase. 
Okay, so if I get to the other end and I'm at, say I'm at post mile zero, and I'm at post mile 10 at the north end, I think it makes sense to put zero because zero miles times 5,280 feet is zero feet. If I was one mile up, I'd start at 5,280. Our specs don't say they have to do that, but if I'm 10 miles up, that one is going to end up at you know 10 times 5,280 feet. That'll be the station. Okay, I'll put that in, and I'll say, okay, decrease, right? I'm going to drive south, and those numbers are, the DMI is going to decrease. Okay, when when I go into that software in the profiler, I have to tell it, give me a pro, a file that ProVal can read. It's going to be, give me that PPF file. There's a lot of other file formats. It's going to give me the PPF file. And when I bring it into ProVal, I'm going to see minus 5,280 or 52,000, whatever the number is, like 280 times 10. And it's going to be, those are going to be negative numbers, you know, approaching the zero. It has to do that because when you're looking in ProVal, you want everything to go from left to right. So this, this plot goes from left to right. If I was heading southbound, I'd just have, I'd be going left to right, I'm just going to have negative numbers. Do you follow? Or? Yep. I'm talking about the difference in the, in the, in the alignment at the end. No. It um, has to do with them, them turning off the equipment. Yeah, you know, this is a... I, I called a buddy and asked him for four profiles he's in the industry that line up. And I, you know, I think he, he, did, he didn't go, these aren't existing baseline pave and fine. These aren't actual files because he didn't have the spec yet, right? But he just gave me four profiles. I think one of these might be on a cold plane surface or who knows. I renamed them. Well, so I have these data. Into looking when we do yeah. it on the old thing. Sometimes when you have starts and stops and opening. Yeah, but, w yeah, w but when you get to the end. Has to do with the with the operator being really, really aware yeah. of where that cone is yeah, for so, the first few days. Yeah, so when you get to the uh, end, I mean, your DMI and all the profiles should be within 50 feet by spec. But there's, you know, that's where, that's what we're saying right now. That when you get a long job, you know, maybe that's too tight. We'll, you know, if that happens and you have an issue, call headquarters, we'll say, okay, there's some special cases I can think of right now. I don't want to go into them, but, you know. My job is 20 miles long. Yeah, so 20 miles if you're off a foot. We were off about 63 feet past, but. Yeah, that's. Yeah, I don't, you know, that's the other thing. Like, we're comparing this whole thing about comparing something to something when they're not exactly the same sections of road they have values on. We're willing to say, okay, you know, that. That 50 foot number was kind of arbitrary. <laughs> it was kind of like, okay, it's 10, you know, 10% of 528 feet. Overall, you know, if we did everything we could to get these things to line up exactly, we'd have a number that's three cents different. Five, you know, whatever. It's going to be in the end, everything's going to even out roughly. So it's just, you know, but we don't want something like this. You can't compare this section to this. You know, if it gets like that, we're good. But if it's you know like that, that's not good. Right. So. Okay, so can you um, scroll that back to the left where you, you were showing us before the leave outs appear on that? Yeah. Yeah, you want the last leave out, maybe is what you're looking for? Leave out any leave out. You had leave outs going across that thing, right? Yeah. There's four of them in here. I probably scanned by a bunch real quick. Here we go. Anyway, I just wanted to be able to show. So that leave out right there is what 10, 10 plus two hundred, hundred plus five fifty. So if you go to your, to your to your spreadsheet, right, you can see the leave outs on your spreadsheet. Yeah. Right? Yep. Yep. So, so we're at station one hundred, hundred thousand two hundred. Yeah. I go to station one hundred thousand two hundred. Go back here. I think I might. Eighty-nine thousand six sixty. I don't know why that other leave out's not 
showing up in there, but. So on, on this spreadsheet, you'll see the different colors of, we see blue and pink and blue. These partial segments that are on the existing file, they're the last segment that's in that colored section. So there's that one that's at 89,660. So. This is a leave out. Yeah, and we also have the section numbers here, section one, section two. These are our section numbers between leave outs. And we've got segment numbers over here. Okay, now, so th that's what we're doing to, to check the profiles. So now we know we have, you know, the basic jobs are covered right now. So let's say we had a job that had a full width segment correction. We go back to that slide and it says, okay, full width segment correction. You're skim grinding the whole job. We're going to add one opportunity for improvement. We want the MRI zero value that we're calculating, the target value to be calculated from the existing. So this yellow column here, where we see yellow, it's user input. You know, this column here is called full width segment correction. Here we're clicking segment two, the contractor put in, he changed one to two opportunities. And what that basically went, the general rule that's in our spec is, this is something I didn't really cover on in detail here. So we have the start, stop, segment length, and the existing profile. That comes from the existing profile. Now we have the baseline profile, the paved profile, and the final profile. We don't bring the stations in again because everything's based on the existing. When we calculate MRI zero, we're basically taking the lower of the existing or the baseline. So here we had, this first segment, we had an existing MRI of 119. And they went out there and did some structural repairs, so the MRI value went down to 89. So we're going to calculate the baseline. We're going to calculate the MRI zero. I shouldn't call it baseline. That's the name of the profile. Based on the lower of those two. So that's how where we get MRI zero from. Now we look at the second segment. We have the existing and the baseline. Well, the existing was 159 and the baseline was 92. How this one's saying 159. When I check this full width segment correction over here, it just locks this MRI va zero value into existing profile. If I You'll see this number change here. If I unselect that, you know, it change takes the lower of the two. If I select it, it's a full width segment correction. We're skim grinding that tenth mile and I'm adding two opportunities for improvement, then our MRI zero is 159 and we use it. This column here shows what pay table we're using. And on this job, it's primarily the 75 target table that maxes out at 450. That's what that 75 pay 450 means. And if it's a percent improvement table, it's PI pay 450. That's the abbreviations I used on this. So here the MRI was over 135, so it went to percent improvement. And that's how we're calculating the adjustment. Now we have this other thing called partial width segment correction. So if I check this, what that's doing is, you know, we're saying, okay, the baseline was 180. They went out and did, they came up with their correction plan. They did some grinding here and there. But they didn't do very much. It was 150. You know, they didn't, you'd think they'd lower it down to 100 or 90. They went to 150. Well, the you know the MRI zero is 150, but that full width segment correction says we don't go into the percent improvement table. We're just going straight to the set standard 75 target table. So that's because this would say PI pay 450 if I had this unselected. So if I if I didn't select that, we'd say I had an existing 180. We did some structural repairs that went to 150 I'm, because that's over 135. I'm taking the lower of those two for the MRI zero because that's over 135. I have to use a percent improvement table. We're using a percent improvement table there. But because it was partial width segment corrections, 
if I check that, it's going to go back to the standard 75 pay table. So you don't really need to know what it's doing. Just know that you got to check. You got to you got to verify that these boxes are checked when they're supposed to be checked. So if there's partial width segment corrections or full width segment corrections, you got to have to keep track of it. It'll be on your plans. You know, your plans are going to have stations on them. They're not going to exactly line up the stations here, but that's why God made engineers to figure out which ones go where, right? So. Question. On, okay. on the full width segment correction, um, for the MRI zero, why does it go to 159.28 and not 92.01? This one here? Oh, up here? Yeah, for the full width segment correction. Okay, so correction. when I... So full width segment correction, if you read the spec, it says use existing as your baseline. That's the thing where they named the existing profile, they call it the baseline profile. They initially meant this was, this is MRI zero, which is commonly referred to as baseline, right? If I put in, if I use my existing for baseline, I just put in 159 here, and it ends up being MRI zero, right? We're, we're using an existing file to determine what the MRI zero is, to determine if it's percent improvement or not. We had that, the name of that change, to enter at one point in time, back to enter, because people were confusing baseline and MRI zero. But I still think we should change it back, because <laughs> it makes it easier to understand, but... The spec calls it, calls it existing baseline and MRI zero. They're three different things. MRI zero is one of those two. Okay, now, now these these payment adjustment amounts right here. These are based on the pave number, right? So <clears throat> this this column here is you check this if this said must correct, the contractor would typically check this. Okay, so I'm going to use the paid file here, but the dollar amount doesn't change. So the dollar amount, the dollar amounts for this paid file and the final file are, are being calculated off to the side based on these pay tables. And because the paid file had a, already wasn't in, in incentive, we can't increase the incentive once they already have incentive. You can't grind into an incentive. So when you check it, it's got the logic built in there, so it's not going to increase it. Does that make sense? Or? So if the contractor had a bunch of mess corrects here, you would have seen this sheet with a bunch of, use the final file as the MRI value. Use the final MRI value. And the reason for that is, you know, every time you run a profile, you'll get a different number. So if the contractor, they might have had a, let's say they were at that upper threshold and they had an 89.9, right? And the part, they can't go over 90. That's the, they had an 89 here. They had 89.99. I'm just making this real extreme. That would have been passing, right? Nothing changes. They go out and measure it again and it ends up being 91. You know, if you use that final file, that would be a must correct. Well, you know, he, he doesn't get double jeopardy. It's based on his first profile that we measured. So, again, like these specs, there's table, there are a lot of tables, a lot of calculations. You really need to know, you know, what all these yellow cells are for and make sure that, you know, they have the right input in them. Everything else is just a function of a calculation out of the table. The most important ones you know, are these first three here. Not the first three, but the, the lift thickness. If I were to change the lift thickness to three tenths, I'm going to have an entirely different set of tables. And it's got a tougher spec. There's there's an issue somewhere. We have a mandatory correction somewhere. So don't, so if I look at the first this one went out of spec. So let's say here's a good example. Like 
using the pay file, it's out of spec, it's over 80. We're using that 60 pay 900 table. They went out and did some corrections. They checked that. Now they're getting their deduction based on that last number. The, the first two columns, the partial width, the full width, segment correction, that's going to come off the plan. Right? You either got a quantity for it or I don't have a quantity for it. Yep. Those, those boxes are just going to come straight off the plans, right? Yep. So these unit, this unit of measure is each, right? Segments are each. I was thinking it was going to be 10th miles or whatever. You called them each? Yeah. Okay. I didn't know that. <laughs> I haven't seen the bid item yet. So you'll roll through the plans, check those boxes if you have them or not. Roll on. Yeah, this is going to be, you know, contractor and engineer got to work together to you know, look at the table and say, which one of these segments, maybe you have one extra or there's overlap. And those boxes will determine your opportunities. And the opportunities can also yeah. be determined based on your payment. Your yeah, so if I, if I have partial with segment correction here, it doesn't matter what I choose here. Nothing's going to change because yeah. it's because it's just locked into the sixty pay nine hundred table right now. Or well, the one that was oh, okay. So if I if I went down here and I, I said okay, use the final profile. We're using this MRI, which is which is passing. It's below eighty. Now we have a dollar amount calculated. And what's kind of really strange is in this example, I don't know how. I change this to a 1500s, watch the dollar amount. It changes, but not by very much. But when you look at all the individual numbers, they change a lot. Just every segment. So can you go back down? Right, this is probably right there. Stop. So on that second row, the segment number two, the, the ALR max, the MRI max, and ALR max. Yeah, okay, so okay, so typically your ALR is always going to be 160 and your MRI is going to your MRI max is going to be either 80 or 90 depending on your layer thickness. MRI max is your mandatory correction level for MRI. Everybody with me? I've just been living and breathing this for a month or two or three. So it's So when I go look at a proval report you know, I, I know that. I can type in that threshold of 80 for MRI or 90 for MRI and 160 for ALR. But there's a few exceptions. Some of these segments might have a number that's a little bit different. When they're different than the, what standard it displays here, I didn't want to have a bunch of, I didn't want to have a bunch of 80s and 160s, you know, filling this whole column up. I couldn't, you couldn't see the areas that are different, so that's the reason. And these only populate when there's percent improvement, which you can tell because every one of these equations start with PI, percent improvement. And there's some more text to give you an idea which table it is. So the contractor would have on the, that one with the down arrow and the user input, and you would be putting zeros in that whole column? Yeah. When, yeah, once he's certified that all the LRs are required. we're on the verifying side. We, we have to check it, yeah. You know, there are cases where I'm not going to, I've got a few calls where, you know, they had an ALR of like 220 and the guy ground it down to 159 when he measured it. And then they go, they went and met, and he, when he was out there, he's, he had his profiler out there, he's measuring, you know, that, those locations, didn't run the whole job. It's 159, then he runs through the whole job, now it's like 161 or something, it's like, you know, there's the RE. You know, he can look at this. It's not in spec, or he can. You know, he's. I I don't think I'd want to tell the tell the contractor that grinder that you just put on the truck and hauled to five hours back to LA. Yeah, bring that back up so I can make that a 159, and then go to a DRB and explain why you made him do that. I wouldn't. You know, that's that's an extreme example, but you know that's spec. Headquarters, we should say, yeah, do it, right? But there's, you know, Ari's going to use some logic right there. So. so 
back to that black box, all those yellow arrows that were up there, those are the things you need to know how to do. And all the yellow boxes on here are those yellow arrows. So how to check. Okay, so... How, how does the spec rate as far as complexity to most of your other specs? <laughs> we can do it. it. All these tables, they look like they're complicated and stuff, but really it's not. You're just, this, whole, this tool here is... So, so scroll, scroll back up to the top of the sheet real quick. I just want to summarize this, see if I can summarize this real quick. Okay, and then some stuff I didn't cover here, but when the contractor's filling all this stuff out, he's putting the project ID in. The contractor name, he's got a drop, drop down choice. This is the list of contractor names that are from the EWB system. This first one, if it was if you had a contractor name that wasn't in the extra billing system, you could you could plug it in over here and then it populates the list so you can fill in this. Let's right. let's go back to the other side. Just back to where you had it. So from an RE perspective, I mean, you're getting all this already filled out. You're just verifying this data in here, all these items. <clears throat> and you're coming down here. He's got all the green stuff. Scroll it up a little bit. He's got all the green stuff filled out. You're checking boxes over here for full or partial width off the plans. You're importing these. If you've got errors of data, it'll turn red. That's where you start zeroing in on and investigating. Well, actually... These red ones here. I mean, the whole cell would be. Yeah, the whole, if the whole cell's red, that means there's an issue. These partial segments that are less than half of a tenth, less than what's that? Four six? I can't remember. Two sixty four. Half of five hundred twenty eight is two hundred sixty four feet. The segment gets less than half a tenth. The specs say we're not making an adjustment on it because it's too short. But they still have to address the LRs. Those go red just to let you know that you know it's not narrow over here just no matter what the MRI values were. There's not going to be an adjustment calculated for it. We're not paying incentives or disincentives based on, on, a, on, a, on a segment less than half of segment length is what you're saying. But they still have to you know, say there's no ALRs. So. Okay. Yep. And then at the, at the end, once it's all verified, you go to the top, green box, right there in the green box, that's the amount you pay in the yep. supplemental fund. Okay, so, you know, the other part is when you look at our specs, you know, there's file naming conventions. So when the contractor fills all this stuff out, you know, it puts a contract number in. I should have put the dash in there. Ten. So once they put the contract number in, you know, this, fill, this fills in the district. And once you have the district number, there's a drop-down list based on the counties in that district. Once you have the district and the county, there's a drop-down list for the routes that are available. We need to know the last six characters of the EA to put in the file name. This is the file name up here. All the all the text, all the information we're entering in these yellow cells is being used to, you know, populate the file name. So. And you have to work from left to right across here. So they can go ahead and click a save button and it basically, you know, it assembles that file name for you automatically. And you can copy that text and rename your PVP file so it has the same name that just ends with PVP. Okay. And then, if, you know, so let's say you agreed with this, this adjustment, you know, you, Click this and it gives you a printout. <coughs> Sometime between now and next month. Today's the 20th, right? There's your, you know, there's your payment. At, that's your backups you can use to support that adjustment for 26,100 and whatever that number is. Okay, we're good. Is there any questions or? Okay. All right. As a group, we'll just kind of go through a couple of these questions. These are kind of teaching moments. 
one in Amsterdam? Everybody got one? All right, uh, question number one. Um, uh, when should uh, the smoothness quality control ban, uh, plan be submitted? A, submitted with the contractor's bid. B, before the job walk. C, on or before the pre-construction meeting. D, it should be submitted prior to the project start date. C, there you go. Good job. Uh, question two. The typical cross-section shows 0.15 feet layer of RHMA G over existing uncorrected asphalt surface. Some of the existing pavement has MRI value both above and below the 135. Which HMA payment adjustment tables apply to the project? A, target 60, target 75, and the percent improvement tables. B, only the target 75 and the percent improvement tables. C, only a 75 target table. D, only the percent improvement table. D. B? B is correct. Okay. Question three. The typical cross-section shows three-tenths of type A HMA over an uncorrected existing surface. The standard specs were recently revised to allow the contractor to break the lift into two 1,500 lifts of half-inch type A HMA. The contractor decides to place a single three-tenths thick lift of three-quarter inch aggregate type A HMA. How many percent improvement opportunities are there? A, one, B, two, C, three, D, four. What did we say? B, there's two opportunities. You just didn't take the option. That's correct. Two opportunities, the contractor was wanting to go for one. <clears throat> Question four, the project specifications include special provisions that allow cold plain surface to be exposed for no more than seven days. The plans call for a mill and fill of a tenth of type H of HMA type A. The contractor decides to cold plain and pave in the same pave back in the same area within the same shift. How many percent improvement opportunities are there? The existing surface overlay being overlaid exceeds the 135. So A1, B2, C3, D4. B2 is correct. Specs allowed it to be, but he didn't choose to choose to follow that option. Who is responsible? There's a question. The specs. It's, this, it's in the same shifts, right? The specs allowed it to be different shifts. He chose to do it the same shifts. He could have done it in different shifts. That's two opportunities. Put a question right now. It's all about just more time. Okay. Uh, well, the contractor has an option to take more time, and you that's an opportunity. That's an opportunity from the state standpoint, right? That's right. Yeah. So, who's responsible for reviewing and processing the payment adjustment sheet for payment? A. Resident engineer. B. The construction inspector. C. The contractor. D. Caltrans inertial profile operator. Buck stops at the RE, right? That's your default answer in construction. <laughs> Question six. The resident engineer is required to import the contractor's MRI values for each of the contractor profiles to ensure contractor did not change any values. Why are we requiring contractor to import values? Why doesn't Caltrans just import the values? A, we just want to keep the contractor busy for no reason. B, requiring the contractor to import the values assures the contractor takes steps necessary to assure all profiles measured and submitted are properly aligned. C, we want to, be, we want to assure the contractor takes steps necessary to complete all mandatory corrections for MRI and ALR prior to submitting their payment adjustment requests. D, both B and C. That's correct. D, both B and C. Question seven, which of the following areas are excluded from measurement with an inertial profiler but are subject to 12-foot straight edge? A, areas within 15 feet of manhole covers, way in motion, railroad crossings, cattle guards, bus pads, and strike-through gutters, fans. B, shoulders. C, miscellaneous areas such as medians, gore areas, turnouts, and maintenance pullout areas. 
D all the above. D all the above. Which of the following is not considered a verification test of inertial profilers? Distance measuring instrument, DMI test, block test, vibration resonance frequency, VFR test, bounce test. That's correct, C. How many smoothness adjustment worksheets does the contractor need to submit when requesting payment? A, one smoothness adjustment worksheet per project. B, one smoothness adjustment worksheet per lane. C, one smoothness adjustment worksheet per wheel path. Who says A? Any hands? A couple? Who says B? C? It's B. All right. Uh, question 10. In the payment adjustment worksheet cells, highlighted yellow indicate A, data that is pending verification, B, values that do not meet the smoothness guidelines, C, cells where the user can enter value, D, none of the above. C. 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 Correct. When should raw PPF files be submitted to the resident engineer? A, within two working days. B, within 12 hours. C, on the same day as profiling. D, B, or C? B. D, B, and B or C, that's correct. Last question, what does the inertial profiler certification program do? A, certifies equi operators and equipment. B, certifies operators and provides a training program. C, certifies inertial profilers only. D, none of the above. A. 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 Man, you guys got 100%.